Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome to the inaugural GRAM webinar. Uh, what we're doing today is discussing how we can develop a sustainable <coughs> skill set from the classroom to the kitchen, and how is really sustainability on the training agenda out there in the food service arena. Uh, my name's Glenn Roberts, and I'm the Managing Director for GRAM UK. Um, we've been uh, instrumental in developing uh, the GRAM Green Paper since 2008, which is independent research trying to establish the behavioural patterns uh, and sustainable skill sets of the, the marketplace as a whole. And today I'm, I'm really grateful to be joined by a great panel of experts who will help us discuss this very important subject. And I'd like to introduce <coughs> first and foremost uh, Mr Simon Frost, uh, who is the Chair of CESA, who will just take a few moments to, disc to tell you uh, his, about himself and, and what he's doing. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, my name's Simon Frost. Uh, I'm current chairman of the Catering Equipment Suppliers Association. Uh, I was elected or nominated, should I say, in November. Uh, I've been in the industry for more years than I care to mention and I've worked for a number of manufacturers. Um, I have a, a definite interest in terms of sustainability and also the education of, of people within this industry and I've been uh, heavily involved in the creation of the uh, education through CFSP, which is the Certified Food Service Professional. Uh, so I'm interested to uh, be part of the debate today in terms of education from a young age and moving up through further education into the skill set when people join the professional ranks. So uh, looking forward to that today. Thank you, Simon, and <coughs> thank you very much for your input. We're going to have with you today. Next, can I introduce uh, Rebecca Hawkins, Dr. Rebecca Hawkins, who is a managing director at the Responsible Hospitality Partnership and a consultancy fellow at Oxford Brookes University. Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I guess in a way I bridge the link between academia and consulting and actually working in the sector. Um, so I make some input into the development of the curriculum within Oxford Brookes University and also within other universities. Um, and my company also runs some training courses which tries to work in the kitchen, in the marketplace, to try to embed behaviour change around the whole sustainability agenda. Um, although I have to admit, in my business, we have banned the S word. We tend to talk mm -hmm. about responsible business uh, because there are some true. issues around mm -hmm. interpreting sustainable mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. our relative audiences. Oh, fascinating. We'll look forward to hearing some more of your opinions then through the, through the next hour. Uh, and finally, I'd like to introduce Cyrus Toddywaller uh, to, I'm sure, known to many of the audience here. Uh, but Cyrus, if you could just tell a little, a little bit about yourself and, and what you're doing in your business. Yes, business sir. is plural. So I'm Cyrus Todiwala, chef patron of Cafe Spice. Namaste, Mr. Todiwala's Kitchen and Asado. And um, I was fortunately born into this process. Mm. So I was born into the sustainable pot being in India and then growing up in a part of India that was very, very undersupplied with water, power, all sorts of things. So sustainability <coughs> is a word that, like you, I don't use, but we just live it. Simply because uh, we know nothing better. We don't waste, we don't do things. And... I'm glad it's come to become an agenda for UK today because the one thing we really need is to be more aware. That's all we need to be more aware and what little part each one of us can play in this mm -hmm. big circle of ours. Fantastic, Cyrus. Yes, we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from you again, oh, I'm you. sure. Um, but of course, what we'd like to do is encourage people to participate in this process. You can do so by putting your questions through to at Gram UK hashtag the go green debate and also questions at the go green debate dot co dot uk i hope that's clear and please please join in as and when you can we'll be grateful for that but let's get started if we start with the first question and perhaps we'll ask this to rebecca first and foremost uh, they're saying our students now in our universities and college etc being taught how in encompassing sustainably is from sourcing ingredients to the day-to-day -day running of a kitchen or outlet. Well, what's your opinion on that, Rebecca? I think sustainability within the curriculum has made it onto the agenda mm. universally. Oh, oh. And I think that that's a really positive move. I think one of the problems is that we're very good at talking about these very big concepts, mm. climate change, mm. food shortages. What we're perhaps not quite so good at is boiling that down into mm. practical actions that mm. fit around functional roles yes. when you get into the workplace. So having an understanding yes. of climate change is very, very important. And for many students, it's also personally mm. highly motivating. Yes. But actually knowing if you go and work in a finance office in, for example, a restaurant, 
<laughs> what does that mean for you? What do you do to change the impact of your restaurant on climate change? And I think that that, in a way, encompasses the whole reason that we as a business don't mm. talk about sustainability, because every person that you talk mm. to has a very different concept, mm. where what True. we need is to be able to have practical agendas, practical actions that aren't big, but that actually fit around mm. the professions that we recognise mm. within our sector. Yes. So, for example, when you say that this is come on to the agenda, finally, or the curriculum, what exactly in simple terms, is a student made to understand? I think students, for the most part, in most universities and mm. further education colleges, will get some understanding of the fact that there is a debate around the issue of sustainability. <coughs> and then it has, if you like, three legs of that stool. It's got environmental issues associated with it, it's got social equity as one part of it, and it's got economic prosperity as mm. a third part yes. of it. So I think they're given that broad-based understanding. And then yep. specific issues are picked out. Climate change mm. has always been the big one. Mm. I like to mm. think that food waste prevention yes. has come up on the agenda, partly mm. because mm -hmm. of the work that RAP have been doing. Yes. Um, I think that energy efficiency has come up on the agenda partly because of rising energy prices and increasingly water and water scarcity and that's partly because of like, the food security issues. Yes. So we pick cherry pick issues. <coughs> mm -hmm. That's uh, quite interesting. I think Sorry. for me though, I think, um, I'm, I mean we're talking about universities here, I think one of the, the key things is that we're leaving the message too late. I think you know this should be ingrained into our, our children at a very mm -hmm. young age when they yes when they start school, before they start to decide what they think their career or their chosen career path mm -hmm. is going to be, we should be having this as part of the national curriculum. And I, I did some research prior to mm -hmm. this just to see yeah. where it fitted within the national curriculum. And I can only find a reference to it in Cage Stage 3 mm -hmm. under Geography. So I don't think it's given enough weight in terms of you know the impact in terms of the environment of our actions mm -hmm. to educate our children at, at early school age before they make their decision further down the line as to what the, do. the the difference between kids growing up in the developed countries of this world and those that d grew up in maybe underprivileged underdeveloped or India is not an underdeveloped country as much as it is got masses of population and mm. issues the the difference between the kids here and the kids somewhere else maybe Africa or wherever is not <coughs> feeling the necessity mm to be able to be conservative mm. and because there is everything at your disposal at the press of a button or the yeah, push right. of a tap or whatever it is it is because the children cannot understand why this debate arises so yes. the question is how much more can we as parents and of course as people who influence influence a small child and tell them look this is what happens and mm. that is what happens mm. so you're right absolutely but it's also the it's also need based it's also mm. need based I still can't throw away empty egg cartons, you know, I can't. <laughs> it, it, it's a mental block there. And uh, we, I take rubber bands to India. I yeah. collect them from the road, I pick them in piles and people are thrilled that I give them free rubber bands. You know, it, it's, it's the necessity. But when somebody joins, sorry, when somebody joins your, you know, it's Cafe Spice, yeah. I mean, you get a, a junior member of the team that yep. joins. I mean, what is their knowledge, apart from obviously the, the colleges, my daughter is at college mm. studying to be a chef. Uh, and so far she's coming to the end of her first year and there's been little or no education yes. in terms of the sustainability aspect. It's all been about craft, yes. skill and how to produce good food. But at no point have they stopped to say this is the provenance of where you're getting the product from, this is how you dispose of it responsibly, this is how you use your equipment to the maximum effect if it's a multifunctional piece of equipment. Uh, when you get somebody come to Cafe Spice are they... You know, One week, completely brainwashed, <laughs> because the staff will brainwash them. Full of elastic them. bands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But everything, everything. You'll find yeah. puddles of things collecting different, different stuff mm -hmm. that are useful. But at the same time, the tutors are also. So I go into a uh, <coughs> catering institute if I do classes in the institute, and the first thing I notice is the tutors come in in the morning, bang, 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 bang. Every burner goes on. Mm. Every mm. oven goes on. Mm. Every salamander goes on. And it's always an issue trying to make them understand why do you need it. Yeah. And the students can't understand. So I think uh, there is a, the adults have to play a very vital role. The institutes that employ people, because for me, it is a matter of saving money, mm. most importantly mm. as well, mm. besides everything else that goes with it. 
So yes, if a young person walks in, they can be rest assured they'll be brainwashed. <laughs> I think it's partly about continuity as well. I think in a way, you know, in the university curriculum, but only a small percentage of our staff are drawn from the universities. You've got that sustainability thing. To some extent, in some schools, it's, it's starting to get there. But then you've got that whole number of career choices that people make to go into the sector, perhaps through further, et cetera, higher education. And they don't always get that continuity, that continued train, sure, sure. so that they don't get mm. the consistency they need to yes. carry the messages mm. right the way through to the workplace. And I think that that's mm. really big. I also think that there's a significant um, job to be done almost with the teaching staff. Mm. Yes. As you say, yes. many of them potentially were in the industry 10 years ago. Um, well, certainly in the last 10 years that I've been working actually alongside the sector, things have changed so vastly. You know, if you just look at the technologies that are commonly used in a kitchen mm -hmm. now, the yes. training programs, the HR yes. resources that go in kitchens mm -hmm. to actually mm -hmm. change staff behaviours, yes. I think that there's a job to be done with the trainers, mm -hmm. helping them to yeah. understand what the sustainability agenda means yes. for you yes. in your well, business. That, well, that very neatly takes us on to the next subject as well we'd like to cover, because of course we've touched upon what are some first world issues we have as well, uh, but also some far-reaching education needs that we then have from cradle to grave, as it were, as well. And I think increasingly we're, we're grasping this sustainab sustainability nettle in some ways. But, but of course, in our side of the marketplace, um, how big a part do you think does equipment functionality play in operating a sustainable kitchen? And, and how aware do you think the education system is of that? And of course, first, really to you, Simon, to, to, to answer that one, perhaps. Well, I think, I mean, manufacturers of been striving over many many years to improve the sustainability of their equipment and with kitchens in the UK especially reducing in terms of size the idea of having a multifunctional piece of equipment yes. is is key I mean you go to the US you walk around the US they have vast kitchens which are miles long and they have one product that will do one yes. particular menu item yes. whereas in this country we will have combi ovens we will have Items of equipment which are not only sustainable, but they're also multifunctional. But also raise the issue of training and ability to operate those products And the manufacturers well. have a responsibility yes. to train. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do see a big turnover of staff, so, you know, there's an yeah. ongoing need to train, and it's how you provide that level of training to the people that are using your yes. equipment. Mm -hmm. I think it also goes <coughs> back to the finance function and how decisions are made. Yeah, One right. of the real yeah. challenges that we have as a business mm -hmm. is getting people onto that sort of return on investment thing mm -hmm. That means that a return on investment of over a year isn't necessarily yeah, right. a bad thing. Yeah, right. And it's actually getting people <coughs> to really think through and understand the longer term implications of, you know, investing now mm -hmm. may save you in five years. Mm -hmm. But in five mm -hmm. years, actually, it may save you more than you think because of the taxation system. Yes, exactly. But it also really touches yeah. upon the very nature of the food service industry, perhaps here mm -hmm. in the UK, oh, that is mm -hmm. still maturing and maturing quickly, is that that long-term view is not taken in the main. The short-termism that exists is quite prevalent and people just needing to get through the expediency of the first six, 12 months of their trading. Mm -hmm. They're and never going to see a return on their investment. But I think there's a dichotomy here because yes. it's certainly, using my daughter again as an example, yes. I mean, she's being taught to, sh to become a chef. Mm -hmm. And, of course, part of the skill base is, mm -hmm. is still pan work because, yes. you know, I mean, so much can be done in a combination steaming oven, for, for example. But... You still need that skill of being able to develop product and cook it in a traditional way, so such as chickens. And mm. I mean, she cooked a roast chicken at, at home the other day and didn't cook it in an, an oven. She was pan frying it and all this sort of stuff, which ordinarily you wouldn't do, but it's still part of the skill that she's got to develop. So you almost lose the focus in terms of the sustainability of operating a multifunctional piece of equipment. But you've still got to try and develop that skill. But I think there's got to be work to combine the two so there's an understanding of what do you think well i think the it depends on the business as well mm. uh i've been in this industry for many years now i joined as a young little lad i think it's for my 40th year in the industry as a chef and <laughs> um, <laughs> yes i know i've survived all these years but <laughs> what over the years and i've uh, in india opened several new kitchens and hotels and everything that kitchen always gets the third degree mm. Mm. Always. And I think even when restaurants operate in this country and then we make beautiful restaurants, you go into the kitchen and you see 
why have they invested everything in the front and mm. nothing at the back <coughs> and i think it's all about cash mm. so the planning process is all about making the place look beautiful sometimes and the vital bits that actually make or break a restaurant mm. sometimes mm. are completely mm. ignored and it also boils down to small people small businesses and they cannot always afford mm. high tech good quality equipment and they will make a short term mm. commitment mm. and then they will spend five times more in repairing it 500 times rather yeah. than spending right. five times more the first time and getting something that lasts them 15 years mm. so I it's all about education i think uh, cesa as a body that represents 200 manufacturers also has a major role to mm. play Yep. and in education too mm -hmm. so besides just conduct conducting exercise with the industry and making the industry away attack the students because mm -hmm. that's your future mm -hmm. and with that comes the tutors the teachers who have less concept i mean uh, just something a child washes hands and half a blue roll is gone and i go buck 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 my heart <laughs> keeps pounding there and i say 1 pound 2 pounds 3 pounds 4 pounds <laughs> my goodness can they ever yes. stop pulling the blue roll out so i think uh, all around we need to we need to be more collectively conscious mm. that we are impacting on a very mm. tiny nation again the word sustainability which is the most difficult word to explain to people yes, needs absolutely. to be decluttered <coughs> and then you'll find that the jigsaw actually fits yeah. quite yeah. easily yeah. I, i think there's a frustration from from a manufacturing point of view and i'll take your point so i mean so as caesar we are trying to develop an educational program, not just the CFSB, but there's plans to develop it further, including apprenticeships and, you know, getting into to the younger generation to assist them in terms of giving them a flavour of what our industry is about. But I think in terms of, from a manufacturer's perspective, I think the frustration still belies that when the specification comes out for a lovely new restaurant, the, the client has said, you know, we want this and we want, you know, we want sustainable equipment, we want stuff that's going to be multifunctional the quote goes in and then of course the price is three times the height of what mm. was budgeted yep. for so that famous value engineering yes. phrase comes Tell in and all of a sudden you know well we can replace that fridge for this one it's not mm. green but it will keep your food cold but yeah. and of course invariably it loses out to that yep. particular yep. argument but i, I think we're, we're, <coughs> we're coming towards an area where the whole arena is starting to change a little bit mm. legislation is being enacted upon the marketplace from from brussels and you know, perhaps that's much maligned on occasions. In this instance, it's doing the right thing mm. by establishing different benchmarks for uh, and better benchmarks for energy efficiency and longevity of usage, whether it is refrigeration and soon to come prime cooking, fryers, etc. All the different parts of the, uh, the kitchen equipment requirement will be encompassed within this. So reputable manufacturers are doing their best to, to raise the floor up to help push the ceiling up as mm. well. Uh, so I think it's all moving in the right direction. It's just we've come, as you were saying, Rebecca, as well, a very long way in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and in this last decade we've then had, it's become a conversation. And it is allied on the backdrop yes. of increasing utility costs, which are driving people financially in a different mm. way, but also that recognition if their business models are tried and tested, it is better to invest a little bit more to help you save a hell of a lot more. Mm. So there is this movement that's happening that way. <coughs> but, but just going back as well to, to back to the education process as well, you know, what is there out there currently for educators in the marketplace? What collateral is there for them to use with their students to say this is a good, bad or indifferent way to, to deal with it? And you know, the question we have is, is what teaching materials are available there to uh, the education marketplace? And the and question mark hangs there in the air with that. I think in a way that's one of the mm. issues that really needs addressing. Of course, mm. there are various books that have been published, um, mm. but I don't know about you, I'm not a terribly good book learner, never mm. have been. I kind of, mm. I like to have things in different formats. Mm. Mm. Um, most of the time, most <coughs> of the staff are left to almost manage their own processes, yes. l manage their own learning, manage what they deliver. Mm. Mm. There's obviously some materials that come out of CESAR. We run mm. our own training courses. Um, I know that the SRA have been working yes. on some food waste yeah, um, training courses with, I think, City and Guilds. Mm -hmm. So there's bits and pieces, but it, it kind of comes back mm. to that having a coherent piece that you can use mm. that's meaningful to the people that you are training um, and that actually engages them. I think it's very easy in this arena to turn people off very easy to be negative and it's very easy to not focus around the issues that matter to a particular mm. member of staff you know i can go and talk in a kitchen i'm sure you do as well about kilowatt hours or food waste yes. 
to staff until I'm blue in the face and they kind of look at me and they go, well, I don't know what a kilowatt hour equates to. Mm. Or why does that food waste matter? It only actually matters to them when you make it meaningful in terms of their job, their life. And, you know, one of the things that's really stuck in my mind in my experience over the last couple of years is one kitchen that we were working in and we'd harped on about food waste as mm. you do um, and then actually the lady who was the kitchen porter said well do you know why it really matters to me I'm going down to the food bank at the moment yes you know to, to feed my yes. children um, mm, yeah. needs must and you know yes, times are hard and my hours have been cut mm. and yet I'm working in a kitchen where I'm seeing mm. food Wasted, going to waste yes. mm. And I, that really, that mm. powerful emotive mm. link, now I'm not suggesting that everybody in kitchens <coughs> goes to food banks, but it's making it really meaningful is yeah. what's very important. Mm. And what's yes. lacking, I think, mm. in those materials, they're very dispassionate. They're very, yes. yeah, I can't yeah. think what the word is. It's become more obligatory rather mm. than something which is more coming from within. Yeah. But at the same time, we can't all be negative because no. Britain, I think, is leading the way mm. in many, many respects. Mm. And I think uh, we are doing amazing things. Uh, from the mayor's office in London to all sorts mm. of things happening all the mm. time. Sustain is doing a super job in making independent people more aware of things mm. going on. And there are several initiatives going on, uh, which kick-started in 2012, yep. which have really become very successful, like mm. green growing spaces. And then yep. how many green growing spaces are there? What kind of food can it provide for London mm. as a city alone? Yes. And all these are bits and pieces. And then, of course, in the greater UK circle, we have the farming community who are shrinking because of different pressures on them. And then we have rare breeds and we have traditional mm. methods of farming. And now we have a huge issue with wheat in Europe mm. because the EU has laid down some specifics and the traditional grains that were being grown in various parts of Europe are under threat of perishing. Mm. And there's a move for that. And that's again sustainability in a big way mm. being impacted on our day-to-day -day life because bread is the essential component of life. Mm. Well, actually, I and think food mm. is the easiest yes. inroad because mm -hmm. I've yet yeah. to meet a chef who isn't passionate mm. about food. Mm. It almost doesn't matter what environment you work in. You're mm. passionate about where it comes from. You're passionate about yes. not wasting it. You're passionate about efficient storage for it. Mm -hmm. And so I think certainly when you're looking at educating, mm. that's a great inroad yes. into actually getting people mm. to really recognise and understand sure. just through that kind mm. of food. Well, uh, and it's essential as well, isn't it, as well? It is. with, well within a our lifespans hopefully you know there will be approaching 10 billion people on the planet that's struggling to feed itself now so those resources will become scarcer and scarcer and more expensive to waste and mm -hmm. according to yeah and according to why Mackie we're throwing away a third to a half of all well the food this is we it produce. and if you're, you're looking at that roughly 30 percent as a minimum yep. of wastage from farm to fork coming through to people's plates mm -hmm. well we have to address that and as Cyrus was saying it's sound business practice to remove that and it does drill down to things like portion control as well. Mm. Uh, and I was mentioning the states, stateside just now. Um, if you've, you've been there yourselves, you'll know the enormity sometimes what is confronted by you on a plate that comes mm. to you. Now, what is right and what is healthy, what is fit? And we start okay. coming to a whole different mm. environment there as well. But what, what are your thoughts on this, Simon? <laughs> well, I suppose from a personal nature, I, I think, you know, certainly the food is thing interests me on a personal level because uh, as you can see I do <laughs> like my food but uh, I think you know I think the retailers have a responsibility here because you know if we do a weekly shop and I know that you know shopping habits have changed the way that people now they tend to to buy bits and pieces when they're necessary I mean I'm still of the old school we'll go out and shop once a week but it's the sell by dates and the use by dates which cause enormous amounts of problems and we find ourselves sometimes throwing away stuff that you look at and you think well, I'm sure that's fine because it's within the date, but you throw it away and you, you begrudge throwing it away because it might be a packet of, you know, chicken or whatever it might be. But you're loath to use it because it says quite clearly used by or best by date has expired. Yes. And I'm sure that some of the wastage can be reduced in that respect because, yeah. you know, as a domestic household with four people within it, you know, we throw yeah. away an enormous well, amount of you know, a lot of it. And, and again, that sort of it converts over to a commercial aspect. Yeah. But it? there are some elements which are quite simple to, to solve as well. It does come back to quality control at the, at the back door when mm -hmm. delivery happens. Mm -hmm. It's then ensuring that the supply chain temperature is correct all mm -hmm. the way through. Yeah. And that the stock, stock rotation is done correctly. Yeah, exactly. and, Education. And, and that there are movements that you will see in the probably midterm with intelligent packaging that is currently mm -hmm. being used mm -hmm. within the uh, supermarket arena. Mm -hmm. 
that may come into our side of the fence as well, where you can engage perhaps electronically with a smartphone with your refrigerator or freezer yeah, exactly. that will tell you what value a product you have in your, your storage system and, and what will be out of date and when. So there's elements like that that, that will come in the fullness of time, not today, but coming relatively yeah. soon, where that will start in some ways de-skilling that issue and make it easier to accept and understand perhaps. But I think we, we, we need to move on a little bit from this subject because there's, as we've just touched upon, it is a very big subject that touches upon all parts of our lives as well. And, and if you guys out there who are part of our audience are enjoying this, um, please send in some questions or retweet to some of your colleagues or friends and help them get involved in this discussion as well. But critically as well here, do you think students are aware of the financial benefits of uh, operating a sustainable kitchen? No. Uh, no. I would say... Yeah. I think, you know, when you get into this sort of thing, I think there has to be a financial reward for the operators, mm. not just in terms of yes. your bottom line, in terms of the uh, saving. There's got to be... We've got to challenge government on this in terms of grants, tax relief, mm. this sort of thing yes. to encourage it. I mean, the government has targets to meet. Mm. We all know that. And it's not going to get there without the help of industry. Right. And I, I mean, cool. not just our industry, but all industry. Yeah. And if a company's demonstrating the wherewithal to support... A reward. It, They've got to be rewarded, whether that's in tax mm. breaks or, you know, as I say, grants, low interest loans to buy new equipment. Because, you know, with the greatest respect, this takes money. You know, yes. it's, you can't just walk into a kitchen. I mean, practices which I, you know, I'm sure Cyrus employs that will change the way that you operate will have a big bearing on, on the net result. Mm. But if you if you're looking to change equipment, you yes. know, refrigerators or yeah. induction hobs or whatever it might be. This takes a massive amount of investment, mm -hmm. and it yeah. doesn't seem fair to me that the operators need to shoulder that burden to reach the targets that are being set by government. So, but I th mm -hmm. to answer the question, I don't think the students are aware of that until they get you know educated. Well, what would you see that, Cyrus? I see that coming to work with you. Well, I see that all the time. Not just coming because I mean I judge several competitions. Yes, and I do so many things. So competition might demand two portions of food being presented. The student comes in with ten. And where the remaining eight go, we don't know. Yeah. And um, the wasted. So it, it, it's just that the f there's a fear. There is no there's no way to connect with the saving or the wastage, mm -hmm. and whether wastage has any impact on eventual cash generation and saving or whatever else. And I think, uh, but students are clever today. Then I think if something is put to them in their in their kind of an understanding, which simplifies it, breaks down into whether it's mm -hmm. something with electronics or whatever it is, they will understand it very mm -hmm. quickly because mm -hmm. I always start, and I remember in this very building, I was giving a talk to the teams of the Nestle Toktor mm -hmm. just two weeks ago, yep. and my topic was sustainability because I speak for the footprint, food service footprint. Mm -hmm. And I was just telling them, just be aware the thing is, and immediately there was an impact on what they were doing for their finals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is because in their simplistic world, I told them, I said, today we can throw a kilo of rice because we don't care. But, you know, 10 people in another mm -hmm. part of the world would yes. dive and kill each other for that one kilo of rice. So mm -hmm. just try and compare and see where it is and what you, where you are mm -hmm. actually making mm -hmm. an impact. Mm -hmm. And I think students are clever enough. We just need to, we just need to gradually and sensibly, like you said very clearly, make them not just aware, but make them connect with it. Mm. And I think also give them the, the tools that they understand or, or give them access to the tools they mm. understand. There's a great little thing that I can use. It's a little app. I can go and if I'm working in a hotel, I can use this mm. app to measure how much water is coming through my shower head and yes. how much I could reduce mm. the cost by Perfect. if yes. I put in a different type of shower head. Yeah. And, you know, and it's great. You download <coughs> it. It's, it works on even my rather antiquated phone because anybody who knows <laughs> me knows that I don't really keep my technology up to date. And it's great. Students don't need to know the names of all of those apps, but they no. need to know the kind of places they yes. can look. And the manufacturers' websites mm. are great. Yes. A lot of the manufacturers have their own universities. They have, mm. you know, where you can go and you can just pick up a module or a part mm. and do it for free. Mm. You can get those sort of apps and making those available. Yeah. So, for yes, example, mm. you know if you're in refrigeration, mm. which refrigerator you want yes. to buy, which is the most yeah. energy efficient, and what makes the difference. Yes. And it gives you something instantly accessible. You don't need to give them all the calculations. They can, no. you know, they can work it out. It's just no. point them in the right direction. I, I and as you say, so, so yeah. they'll go. Accessibility is absolutely key, isn't it? And, and what we've seen as a recurring theme throughout uh, the Graham Green paper every two years since 2008 
is it's improved a little bit. We still have enormous amounts of people approaching three quarters of the people that are engaged enough to want to involve in that piece of research that aren't aware of incentives that are being presented by the by government or associations. So we have a bit of a communication issue that, that mm. is that is uh, an There's also a fear, for isn't us. it? Yeah. There's a fear. I don't yes. know. I don't understand. Yeah. So how do we simplify it and make it clear and simple and easy to understand and engage with? Yeah, but students for for that uh, matter, I think uh, the the important thing is like you said, you know, give them devices that they can work with and understand the whole system better. <coughs> but at the same time, it is uh, very important for them to be able to connect it personally. So when they don't have money, they scrimp and scrounge. Mm. Yeah, if they're living in a hostel, don't have money, they will find the cheapest solution to feed themselves mm. and they will do a good job of it. So why in another environment can't they think the same? Can they not think differently? And I think it always works. I. I start off by telling them these things that just be aware and this is your country, it's a tiny little nation mm. for instance. We are throwing away millions of tons mm. of waste matter in mm. every shape or mm. form. Imagine what is happening to where it's going inside, mm. it's your world, we will be dead and gone and you will have no water and no mm. power and you will have a polluted atmosphere, what are you going to do about it? And things like that, you just gradually make them aware that this is their nation, they need to look after it. Mm. The future of Britain is in their hands and you'll be amazed at how contributive they are like that. How they grasp that, yeah, that's interesting. I, th yes. I think it, it comes back in a way to making the curriculum very relevant mm. for the mm. role that you're going to play mm. in the future. So for example, <coughs> One of the things that I think is slightly frustrating when you're dealing with the curriculum is you often sustainability is an elective, so you choose to take it, so you're already right. passionate. Mm -hmm. Where actually what I'd really love to do is I'd love to have everybody mm -hmm. at whatever level who's interested in studying human resources yes. in the sector, and I'd love for everybody who's studying human resources in the sector to have one part of their education programme that talks about how they set key performance indicators for people around yes. that environment mm -hmm. thing. Okay. So how do you put those into mm. contract? How do you include them mm. into performance reviews? Mm. Just the same as everything else they do. And that's one of the key things to just, in a way, doing what Zara is talking about, to make it very mainstream. So rather than saying, we'll take those, you know, some people have a huge passion and that's fantastic yes. and we need to build on that. Yeah. But we also need to find some ways for those people who have less passion or less enthusiasm to make sure that they still get that bit of education. They might not call mm. it sustainability. They might call it mm. key performance indicators in contracts. Yes. Mm. But they've got that, mm. that piece. And yes. immediately then it affects yes. their remuneration because it's yeah. the KPI will yes. impact in that terms of their, month, yeah, their annual the pay review or mm -hmm. whatever it might mm -hmm. be. And sometimes, yeah. and I think Rebecca's absolutely right, mm -hmm. sometimes if you're not if you're picking on the guys that aren't necessarily as passionate as mm. Cyrus has explained as Rebecca has illustrated, you still need some yes. kind of incentive yeah. to drive that necessity. Yes. And invariably it will come down to well, that, money. That right. comes on as well to the next point as well. And, and you mentioned there, so it's about the individual responsibilities that we all share with this. And yep. each journey comes with the first step. And, you know, all those cliches apply in many ways. But fundamentally, whose responsibility is it then to, to educate um, our children and ourselves in this process? Uh, we touched upon it from, from the get-go, really, from cradle all the way through. What, what are your thoughts on that, Simon? Well, I, I think it's, it's mixed, isn't it? I think as parents, we have a responsibility. Uh, I mean, you know, I get sick of the sound of my voice at home when I'm <laughs> coming home and saying that the place looks like Blackpool Illuminations because all the lights have been left on. But I think as, ad you know, as, as parents, first and foremost, we have a responsibility to educate our children of, you know, simple things like turning lights off. You know, they don't need the heating on. If it's, if it's a bit chilly, put a jumper on. Don't necessarily put the central heating on. So I think as parents, we have a responsibility. But I still go back to the fact yes. that I think education needs yes. to start within mm. schools. And I think it can't be, you know, to take Rebecca's point, it's got to be more mainstream. It's got to form yes. part of the curriculum. So it, it starts from a young age. So when they get into the professional mm. ranks and they join Cyrus at Cafe Spice, they are already ingrained in terms of yes. the benefits of having a sustainable yes, operation right. and it makes it easier but for the what, employers what, then what to... What can to we do them? in that gap period between, that reality gap between where we are now and, and where we hope to be? Um, where does that response be like? Do, do you think operators assume somebody else is doing it for them? Or? No, I, I think a lot of the the operators that have got the big responsible business mm. commitments, partly because of their mm. requirement for transparency yes. Yes. have their own training programs mm. and training initiatives yes. so you'll see any number of them with their own you know the we mm. care or you know they've all got mm. those sorts of names 
initiatives which train the people within their businesses. I think one of the challenges, and this is where we really need leaders like Cyrus, is getting those out of individual businesses and more broadly spread mm. across mm. Um, the piece. But I also think it's people like Cyrus telling us that actually, as a sector, we, we want this, mm. we need mm. this. Mm. Yep. And I think yep. that's p possibly the problem because <coughs> every now and then we do knock on the doors of very large companies who probably try and tell us to get lost. <laughs> and we go back and knock again because they kind of go, well, sustainability, oh, yes. it's not important to us. I and it takes yeah. a while and you need to get mm. leaders, you know, there's no point in me, I'm a consultant, I'm trying to make mm. money out of it, so of yes, course quite. I'd knock on their door, wouldn't yeah. I? And yeah. um, you're yeah. trying to sell them equipment, which exactly. saves them money through it, so of course yes. they'll go to you, but yes. you've got such a fantastic role mm. to play, because you are a leader, you do it, you know, you say, you think about the pounds as somebody's, and mm. that's great, that's the yes. information that we need to get out there. Mm and the people we are, need. Are, are you just hinting, just very slightly there, about the reality gap between a corporate social responsibility statement and the reality? I or, or, or do you think <laughs> that there is, Or do you think there really is a lot of effort that is going in, in to assist this? My personal view, uh, I know a lot of the people who run the CSR mm. programmes within large corporate companies, is that the people who run the CSR programmes are extremely committed mm. to what they do and extremely passionate about what mm. they do. I think as a corporate company, and this is why training and education is so important, mm -hmm. it is immensely difficult to carry that enthusiasm and that passion of yes. what is, if you like, a small yes. team across hundreds of units, mm -hmm. sometimes not just in the UK. And there are set procurement field. teams. Procurement teams, especially difficult mm -hmm. to influence, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that the people who are charged with it are passionate, mm. but they, I think, are almost begging mm. for yes. the tools to make it much mm. more embedded across their estate mm. because ultimately they want to be transparent, mm. they want to report not yes. just on the good, the one, sorry. Go on, sorry. Finish, finish, finish it, finish it. but also they want to be able to address mm. what they're not doing so well yes. in, if you mm. like, a safe space. And I think that's what we need to provide them. Yes, with. something very simple as mm. well, because I keep uh, telling people, and this is strange coming from an Indian's mouth, is we have no pride in Britain. Mm. We lack pride. And uh, we have, we are the most multinational country in the world, perhaps. But no single child is made to feel British, mm. made to feel proud of this country. You go across to Europe, uh, same Britishers who wind down the windows and <laughs> throw a cigarette wrapper on the road, We'll never do that in Switzerland or Germany or Austria. Why do we do it here? And it is because we have no pride in our own country. If you instill pride into every single child in this Britain that this is your country, your nation, you are going to safeguard its interest. They will automatically drop that stupid word, corporate social response, mm. just make it social responsibility. Yes. Mm. And every individual in this country has a right to this nation. Mm. He feeds off it, lives off it, earns from it. Mm thrives on it. Yes. It's our responsibility to give mm. something back mm. all the time. And yes. I think that is the word pride mm. in Britain. And it will change everything. Mm. Just from school, mm. little kids, you know, make them proud. We are afraid to put our own Union Jack on buildings. You know, that says something for this country. It's silly. In India, we'd fly the flag anywhere we get an opportunity. The Indian cricket team is playing. The whole nation is flooded with <laughs> flags. <laughs> but here, oh, we'll hide the flag. You know, I can't mm. sign the flag because somebody might say well, something to well me. Well, you've got about nine days to put together your own political party to help <laughs> us with that. <laughs> I don't want to yeah, get involved in politics. I'm just saying, that's, 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 that's what we need point. to do. Uh, that's I an think just point. A, if I may pick up on Rebecca's point about corporate social responsibility. Mm. I mean, I think one of the concerns for me is that sometimes you get these large companies that just use it. They have a, a site on their web page, yeah. which is all about course, But where's the substance behind it? Mm. I think, you know, they, they'll write a mission statement, which, mm. you know, makes all the right noises. But where is the actual concrete action? Sort of Translate into behaviours yeah, exactly. and acting. And I think, that actually you know, sometimes these guys should be challenged on this. Yeah. You know, we should be, you yeah. know, the, well, the students should be challenging these yeah. guys. I mean, well, you know, unfortunately, exactly the, the, the real drive will always be be a financial imperative Correct. and where that comes with landfill and, and waste and, and escalating utility yeah. costs Correct. that sort of environment for those that degree of change is starting to appear and starting to generate some more meaningful change rather than perhaps just relatively empty uh, corporate statements yeah. then being made um, but perhaps we can move on a little bit now yes. as well. so I think we as if we're touching upon again this massive overarching uh, points that, that touch us in many different ways in, in different areas and uh, I'm very interested about how do you think sustainability is being integrated into Chef's continuing 
professional development as well, which of course is very hard in a marketplace. It is very fast moving. The churn of employment is difficult. Where is it? Is there a theme that's out there? Do you believe that's happening? That's helping support people as they develop their skill sets through their careers. I think there's a growth in that, mm. and I think uh, more young people are getting more aware, and chefs are getting more aware of what's around them and what they can access and what the tools are, and I think they are yeah. they are that that the, the information is being uh, disseminated down, and I think it's only a matter of time before <coughs> it comes a full mm. circle again, mm. because people are demanding. Yes, and I think it was when. Uh, there was a stage when you know when investors in people was flying high, mm. yeah. and uh, businesses were only dealing with businesses that had an investors in people mm. standard uh, <coughs> in their businesses. And I think this is going to come as well. People are going to question sustainability, what your processes are, what your principles are, yes. and uh, students will need to start questioning that. Mm. And when they start questioning that, the whole world will open up to them. And the employer, as his teacher or the tutors before them, will be forced to actually investigate and play the ball. <coughs> I think we also have to be very careful to use the terms that we use with care. Yes. Because we talk about chefs and there are some absolutely yes. brilliant mm. chefs in this mm. industry. But certainly one of the mm. things that's happened over my career in some environments is there's been a, a move away from genuine chefs who, mm. who yep. cook and create mm. into people who cater who perhaps yeah. reheat and yeah. and I think that when we're talking about the industry as a whole mm. and influencing it, yeah. chefs are crucial. Mm. But I think actually when we're talking about CPD, it yeah. almost matters as much if not more in some mm. of those other environments where you don't necessarily mm. have somebody who would associate themselves as being a chef or being on a CPD program or mm. recognising that it's relevant. Mm. And of course there are training agencies yes. that offer programmes out to those individuals, mm. but they're not necessarily the types of programs that will really help to take the sustainability mm. agenda mm. forward. And often those organisations are the precise organisations that have got the big CSR commitments. Yes. So they're the ones that almost mm. have the greatest need mm. for something that is mm. coherent and that takes the people who work for them to the next stage. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, we're moving into the last quarter of an hour, roughly, of, of our hour now we have. So 45 minutes gone already. Hey, there you go, Cyrus. Yeah. If I can just, uh, just allow me just to ask a couple of specific questions yep. to each of you as well. And if I could start with you, please, Simon, and, and say what initiatives do you think can be introduced to, to the kitchen to further sustainability learning and, and people's understanding of this? And uh, what financial incentives or other things do you think can be applied? Um, I mean, in terms of the initiative, I mean, I think we've already touched on the fact that we feel that, you know, mm. education has got to start much, much younger than it is. Uh, I mean, for me, I mean, uh, again, I was just sort of giving this some thought, you know, prior to coming into here. And I mean, I think in every kitchen we have what we call as a, a first aider. So you'll have a first aider mm. who is responsible for, you know, if somebody cuts themselves with a knife or drops something on their toe, you have a nominated first aider within it. Why wouldn't we have somebody that is like mm. a, a green officer or a, a sustainability mm. officer? I mean, we're using the S word there, but we can <laughs> think of some title for them, which mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have to be the head chef or it doesn't have to have to be the food and beverage manager. It can be, it can empower a member of the team who is then responsible for, you know, disseminating information on a monthly basis that revolves yes. around how to improve the operation, how to improve on waste management, how to yes. improve on the supply chain of food and that sort of thing. And it empowers an individual. So it goes back to the KPIs of personal development. I think yes. that empowerment yeah. word is yeah. absolutely essential yes. because we find in our training that often actually it's not the chef who takes on no. the mantle of these things. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've probably worked with more kitchen porters really? than chefs. And one of the reasons that a lot of people in kitchens enjoy mm. the whole sort of green thing is mm. it does empower them. Mm. And, you know, actually kitchen porters are really great people to get mm. empowered because mm. they're the person yes. who's taking the bin mm. bag out and throwing it yeah, in the exactly. bin. Mm. And if you can get that person, which we did in one of the businesses we talked to, to weigh that bin bag yep. and to become Absolutely. a terrier and to go and talk to the procurement person, mm. they can actually make such a big influence. And I think it is about empowerment mm -hmm. and I think that sustainability issues especially when you're working in a kitchen and you don't necessarily have a lot of responsibility 
one of the great things you can do is you can give people the freedom to have some responsibility yes. and to earn some additional respect. Yes. And that's, exactly, you can't yes. replace that with money. Yes. And that, that people yes. come out of their shells mm. with that. I mean, yeah. you know, you touched mm. on it, you know, the world becomes open to them. I yes. think, you know, you empower yes. somebody to mm. have some responsibility mm. who may not be the executive or head mm. chef or sous chef. Mm. All of a sudden, this guy feels like he has a vital role within the kitchen as part of the brigade yeah. or yeah. part of the establishment that can then influence yes. what happens within that kitchen. Can you just embellish for me as well, Simon, what, what responsibility CESA feels uh, in this direction as well and how you see the CFSP uh, qualification developing perhaps down this route? Well, as you know, see, it's yes. the Certified Food Service Professional mm. qualification has been around now for about five or six mm. years. Uh, we've had 300 people go through it, mm. um, and now many of those people are now re-accrediting, mm. and we're trying to add to the value of that by creating new lines of education and mm. we've got CFSB enhanced which is yes. a, the next stage up mm. for those people that have already done it mm. but we're also my vice chairman actually mm. Steve Elliott is mm. very yes. much passionate about developing apprenticeships for for the industry all right with a bias maybe yes. to technicians mm. who are going to repair the equipment but to try and give them a flavor of the industry mm. to create a a CFSP light, if you will, yes. which is a, mm -hmm. a, a bite-sized piece mm -hmm. of the overall qualification, mm -hmm. which at least enables somebody who may pick up a spanner or a screwdriver to repair right. the equipment to actually understand, albeit in a smaller quantity, what the industry that they're entering is all about. So, you know, we're trying to develop that along with, you know, further training in terms of sales training and, and product knowledge through mm. manufacturers for our customers as well. So mm. there is an awful lot of work going on do, at the moment. Do you think there is that, well, between all of your members, there is enough collateral within there to help assist the wider marketplace in demystifying and simplifying this process to give advice and help to people? Oh, I think definitely. Mm. I mean, we have enough people mm. uh, and manufacturing partners that have, mm. you know, such as Graham, mm. such as Williams, such mm. as all of... The people within our industry have their own mm. ideas and takes in terms of how they mm. can affect decisions and benefit the kitchen, not just with their own products, but on a wider perspective than that. So, yes, okay. there is, and I think mm. that would be a good formula yes. for, for okay. maybe one of the CFSB enhanced modules yes. that are coming out. Thank you, Simon. So there's a drive coming from that side. Definitely. Yeah. Rebecca, could I just ask you, um, do you foresee that in the near future there will be a, a significant shift within the education system to help respond to this drive or need for, for s sustainability and so I keep using the S word don't I apologies um, <laughs> this, this process moving forward um, do I foresee it I don't know I think mm. that there's increasing <coughs> pressure on yes. education it's being drawn in different directions um, and of course more and more people I think will stop doing mm. if you like the formal university FE route and yes. go into apprenticeships which is no bad mm. thing mm. Yeah. Um, I suspect, as we get more affected by some of these issues, mm. they might get embedded into the curriculum um, more. Mm. My suspicion is that to actually break it down into those really useful, functional yes. roles mm. would need an external organisation, mm. perhaps, yeah. you know, a CESA or, or a mm. another, to start providing the information. I mean, I don't think there's a lack of information. I think it's probably too much information. Yes. Mm. But to consolidate it into yes. something that is mm. useful mm. and to give what are very overstretched teaching mm. teams, because yes. I do often look at my colleagues mm. in university environments and think, blimey, that's quite a hard job. Yes. Um, it's resourcing. Mm. It, to give them the, an easy way to do it in a way that they can acquire the skills and the knowledge in a safe zone. Mm. Okay, thank you. Cyrus, I think we probably know the answer to these two questions, but we're going to ask you anyway, is that when you recruit new staff, how much do you take on board their understanding of sustainability in their recruitment <coughs> process? And then when you have them on board in their induction process, what do you do with them? So when somebody comes in, they, we have to treat them as though they have no knowledge about it. I see. Uh -huh. And uh, because um, the moment you start with that, then the person who's interviewing also feels, oh, he knows a lot, but... Mm. We have to presume that people don't understand our ethos. Yes. Mm -hmm. Other people's ethos are different. You know, every organization is different. So we do run through the whole process. So just during their uh, <coughs> process of walking around and seeing things, they will be told mm -hmm. what the different processes mm -hmm. are here and what. Yeah. Of course, they always throw everything at me, and they say the <laughs> boss gets very angry. You know, <laughs> and the <laughs> boss is, and the, the instant fear of this boss. <laughs> and then he comes smiling and they say, oh, the guy's not all that bad really, <laughs> but he gets ticked off if yes. things are left off, yes. taps are left running or yes. things are like that. Mm. 
and uh, but eventually they fall into that process it's very difficult also because where people come from they're not yes. used to it yes and uh, it has to be constantly constantly mm. monitored how do you try and control your food wastage and, um, and aspect uh, of things we used to wait mm. uh, uh, the food waste all goes for composting mm. so every week uh, how much went is uh, put up Mm -hmm. And they know how, how much waste went in, and at the same time, what they yes. can reduce. Mm -hmm. I will go and ruffle through the bins myself mm -hmm. in the garbage room. Yep. Welcome to my well world. <laughs> yes. well, that, 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 that small anecdote here. My my first hands-on chef's job that I had was in a five-star hotel back in the early eighties, and uh, the, the the figurative kick up the backside wasn't a kick, figurative kick up the backside. It was a kick up the backside, and the exec chef used to come in and investigate the swill bin. Mm. And if he found things he wasn't happy with, you would actually be kicked up the backside. Yeah, because his food cost was very and important. And depending to how much it was, depending on how much how far the run-up was. Yeah. So I know it's for a change very much in these days. I don't quite see do you doing that with your size <laughs> tens, but you never know, <laughs> do you? I'm hiding but my feet now. It, it yeah. <laughs> but it is a challenge, isn't it? And it is a major challenge. Also, the understanding of basic things that uh, what is recyclable and what is not recyclable yes. is a very yeah. big question, mm -hmm. I think, and there's so much confusion out mm -hmm. there in the first instance. Mm -hmm. And that then changes according to who you're using as yes. your waste collection Absolutely. agent. And there's no standardization of bin colors. There are a number sure. of things that mm -hmm. the suppliers mm -hmm. could do to support. Mm -hmm. So it's a constant, it's a big yes. puzzle out there, well, but ev everybody and every one mm -hmm. of us makes an effort. Well, if everybody had just a small percentage of your enthusiasm and drive for this, Cyrus, we'd be living in a much better world, wouldn't we? We will um, be. So, do you think, are we right to be concerned about the, the lack of emphasis placed on s sustainability in the food service arena within the education channel? What do you think, Rebecca? Yes, obviously. Yeah. I mean, we are an industry that is dependent upon food. You know, everybody mm -hmm. has a very intimate <coughs> relationship with food. Yeah. And, you know, I think I go back to the, the point that sustainability is almost raises most passion when you talk about food because we put it in our mouths, it feeds our bodies. Yes. Um, and I think that, you know, we are in a position at which over the next 10, 15, mm. 20 years, certainly if you read all of the data around, we're likely to have less food available. Um, or at least less good quality food available at low cost, yes. and that's just going to affect everybody yeah. in the industry. Yes, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Mm. Sorry. No, go yeah. on. Carry on, Cyrus. I think uh, the one thing that we in our industry itself forget, mm. we are one industry that encompasses every other industry yes. in this world, yes. and every other industry around you is all encompassed in this one industry. Mm. So we have probably the most crucial role mm. to play in everything. Mm right from our obesity mm -hmm. issues to health issues to wastage to food mm -hmm. to pollution to yeah. whatever i think once you look at our industry as a whole and it's a, i give people the example of a ship sailing out mm -hmm. when a ship sails out it's a city mm -hmm. it's not a floating you know piece of metal yeah. it's a city with everything within it and that's our industry our industry is everything within it so we are concerned about people's housing, we are concerned about their welfare, we are concerned about their wives being sick or parents mm. being involved or something. And right now the earthquake in Nepal has involved mm, all yes, of us. One absolutely. of our chefs, whole house has been smashed, you know. Mm. So we are all suddenly mm. involved in this little activity there mm. that his family is embroiled in. So we are part of the yes, whole world. Absolutely. And if you think about it, we are trendsetters. Mm. You know, you often have your first experience mm. of something in a restaurant. You go yeah. to a restaurant and you have your first yes. experience of some kind of food, some kind of new food production system, and it becomes acceptable and normal. Um, and I think that mm. that power... Yes. Is, is, oh. is huge mm. It's mm. and you know it's a fantastic mm. industry because yes. it takes it seriously mm. so Simon if you were you were given one wish by the genie in the bottle uh, what one thing do you think we could do in the food service industry to improve this uh, knowledge and awareness uh, I think there's I mean <laughs> I think you could answer that in a number of ways yeah. I mean obviously I've harped on about education mm. from a young age but I think uh, in the current standpoint I think to to assist with the development of the knowledge, I think first and foremost to coin a phrase right. that this young man has used many times, it's got to be fun, it's got to be engaging. Yes. I mean yeah. you've got to make it uh, reasonable for people to understand why you're promoting this message but mm. it's got to be fun, there's yeah. got to be a benefit to it mm. and people have got to want to engage with it and understand yeah. it. Yes. I think from, a, from a, an industry point of view I think we've got to get better at conveying the message as to why you would buy this piece of equipment over that piece of equipment and these are the benefits behind it and if you have to pay 
X amount more for this piece of equipment over that piece of equipment, then this is the benefit and these yes. are the reasons why. Yes. And finally, I would say government has got to get behind this, has got to support this initiative, not just for the hospitality industry, but for all industry. If a company is prepared to put its money where its mouth is and make a decision to improve its operational facility, be it through equipment or through behavioural practices, yes. then it's got to be rewarded. Okay. And, and Rebecca, to say the same question to you really, what one thing do you think would make the, the biggest change in the curriculum, both in the classroom and also, of course, in the workplace? I just think a, a willingness in the workplace mm. to drive the agenda to mm. you know buy some training to you know mm. I, I yeah, think absolutely. if everybody in the workplace bought one small piece of training they'd find their teams would be more motivated yep. they start reducing their resource costs yes. as long as it's good quality training yeah. um, yes. I just think that that willingness to come out of the woodwork mm. and do it will pay back multifold and will mm. hopefully deliver the fun that you're looking for as well yes mm. ours does <laughs> well done. And Cyrus, what, what do you think? Don't ask, you don't have enough time. No, no, we have to. Well, go on. You, you, but I'm greedy, yeah? Yes, you I have be three greedy, wishes, so. I think, because the genie three, gives then. three wishes, right? Okay. The first one well, would be that one, two, and three. CESA would build me a brand new kitchen, wholly ah, sustainable. Okay. <laughs> That's the first wish. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the other thing, of course, is the most difficult thing that we have is making the associations that work with us more understanding. Mm. So, for instance, the councils, the waste people, mm. they actually do not follow through your own, uh, <coughs> you know, your own uh, systems of waste management. Mm. I have seen that the truck comes in and takes everything together and boom. Yeah. So education at their level. The council themselves mm. need to be aware of what they are doing. And I, w I would want to wave a wand at them and say change. Mm. The third thing, of course, is people coming in and people coming in with a basic common sense and this great feeling of attachment to your job, to the environment and to the country you live in and I think everything around that will change. Okay, thank you Cyrus. Well we've touched upon quite a few subjects here and probably just scratched the very surface of it haven't we and, and no much more than that um, but you know we haven't unfortunately had any time for any of the questions that we've had sent in but what we'll try and do is uh, respond to them uh, and blogs blogs etc and come back with some responses too and thank you very much for those people who have sent those questions in and of course I have to thank the panel for coming along it's been oh, thank you. stimulating and interesting as you said so I sat how it went pretty quick so thank you Nigel uh, Simon sorry <laughs> where'd that come from <laughs> thank you Simon <laughs> <laughs> thank you Rebecca and thank you very much Cyrus for, for helping us out with that and uh, the next stage of what we're going to try and do uh, moving forward with these webinars, which we hope to involve the current panel as well moving forward, uh, is that we'll have a, another webinar on the 25th of June, which will be based upon how to achieve a sustainable bottom line. Uh, and of course, operational efficiencies are the recipe for business success, and how do we get that message across uh, to the overarching marketplace as well. Uh, any questions you may have, please direct them to www the gogreendebate.co.uk and, uh, and let's move forward from there. Um, we will then finalise our, our uh, webinars with an event on the 20th of October at the Charlotte Street Hotel in London where we want to hold the Graham Green Summit where we'll try and encapsulate and pull together all of these subjects into one particular day. Uh, but thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thanks again to the panel. It's really been very stimulating, thank very you. interesting. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.